Welcome to the Inside Pitch. I'm Christopher Lockhart, the creator and administrator of this private Facebook group where screenwriters, creators, filmmakers meet to ask and answer questions and exchange ideas and information on the craft and business of movie making. I am joined as always by my co-host and co-administrator of the Inside Pitch, Ramesh Santanam. Hey, Chris. Hello, What's going everyone. on, Ramesh? Oh, not much. Excited about today's interviews. Man. Hey, we have two writers who made the 2022 annual blacklist, uh, which is a wonderful thing. First up, we have Alexandra Lexi Tran. She grew up in Glencoe, Illinois as a mixed race kid and dual citizen. She brings her lifelong perspective as a perpetual outsider to female driven stories. Her experience in behind the scenes machinations of corporate finance, medical startups and architecture was excellent preparation for her biggest adventure yet, marriage and a business partnership heading to a headlining magician. As a writer, her pilot, Weave No Trace, is set up with Juvie and currently going out to market. Her feature, What a Doll, was on the 2019 hit list, and her feature, Black Girls Don't Swim, was a top five finalist for BET slash Paramount Players Project Create and has State Street attached to produce. Her feature script, It's a Wonderful Story, made the 2022 blacklist. She is repped by Bellevue and APA. We also have David L. Williams. He is a former Brooklynite turned Angelino who's been writing screenplays since working at Blockbuster centuries ago, he says. Uh, Latino slash black former pro gamer and D1 athlete, David specializes in galactic concepts that are grounded in the real world with real people as well as thrillers that leave you with a heart condition. Lexi and Dave, welcome to the Inside Pitch. Hello, hey. hello. Hi, thanks so much for having us. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for being here. And, and um, we appreciate it. You know, it's a Sunday morning and it's Super Bowl Sunday and you know, people have parties and, and whatnot. And, and so, um, but this is far more important. And way more fun. <laughs> us. Yeah. Come on, you know. For me at least. <laughs> This and, is the Super Bowl. I don't know if you guys talked about it. This is the Super Bowl. That's right. Well, you guys, you guys kind of found your way to the Super Bowl for uh, screenwriters with the blacklist. And, and uh, so we want to talk about that, along with just trying to uh, look at your origin stories a little bit and sort of how you got there. Uh, because my guess is it probably was a little bit of legwork. My guess is that Bobby just didn't write a script and send it out to somebody and all of a sudden you ended up on the blacklist. I mean, maybe it happens that way, but, but I tend to doubt it. Uh, and so I love for people to hear the stories behind the stories. You know, I mean, it's great. Congratulations. You made the blacklist. Thank but you. I guess is, that was uh, years of work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I don't know. Why don't we start with Lexi? Sure. And you want to maybe just sort of give us a, a, a thumbnail view of sort of your origin story, uh, where you started, how you fell into writing, and you. Uh, were you from Illinois? Is that what I heard? In yes, the, uh, I'm, okay. I'm from the suburbs north of Chicago, um, which I colloquially refer to as the John Hughes. John Hughesville uh, of, uh, of America. So um, yeah, that's, that's where I'm from. Um, born and raised, no writers in the family. Um, no one in my family is in the arts. And I was one of those kids who uh, was very, very early on really taken with worlds that I could enter through writing, through movies, through shows. I really focused on features because my parents had a rule that I could only watch one TV show or one movie a day. So obviously a movie lasts longer. So I watched one movie every day and that's how I developed kind of my, my focus in features. And I began writing um, with fan fiction in the early 2000s. So this would have been like, you know, the early days where that was kind of an availability. And it was a great training ground because you can play anonymously online with characters that aren't your own. So there's less creation work to do. Um, and it was like discovering my right hand from then on. It was like, this is what I, this is what I do. This is what I want to do. And everything from there was geared towards that kind of career. Uh, with of course the reality of 
film school wasn't an option. Um, so my goal became, all right, we'll get as close to the action as possible. So I came to college in California. I went to Scripps College in the Inland Empire and every summer did internships. Um, my very first was at a company that produced Children of Men, which is like one of the seminal, you know, forever will be known as like the greatest sci-fi ever, uh, you know, adaptations. And um, I did a summer at ICM in the MP Lit department, and I still have scripts that I stole from that internship. <laughs> what year did you do that? What year were you there? What was that? Remember? What year were you there? That would have been 2006. I was there. I, I was, was working there. under um, Dan Rabinow, I want to say. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I learned a ton from him, learned a ton from his assistant, and read everything under the sun. Um, and then so I you were in the, the very... new building then. You were in the new building. Yes, I, I no, no, it was maybe like no, it was just before it was just we before. moved. That's right, yeah, yeah just that's before right. they were gonna yeah, move like that, that fall, yeah, yeah, wow. Well, um, look at that, we were like two ships passing. I know, I know. a little 19 year old me, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so then I had a very brilliant idea to graduate right when the economy crashed in 08 on the tail end of the writer's strike of 07, 08. I know, brilliant timing on my part, right? <laughs> um, and so uh, there was no real option at that point to leverage those internships. So the game changed. It became, mm. okay, stay in LA as long as you can, do what you need to do to pay your bills and write as much as you can. So I worked, I got corporate jobs as an executive assistant in all the industries that Ramesh listed off for you. And I wrote nights and weekends and just, put in the time, put in the grind, the 10,000 hours. Um, so that was many years. And I finally kind of hit a breakthrough uh, at, in about 2018 when I wrote the script Black Girls Don't Swim. And I finished it literally the night before it was due for this contest that Paramount Players was running. And I ended up placing in the top five of that contest. And that was fantastic. And then nothing came of it. Um, so I wrote other stuff and I put that on the Blacklist website and that's where my manager, uh, my now manager, Kate Sharp found it and we've been together ever since and we've put in the work and we wrote, you know, I wrote, it's a wonderful story and that's gotten me on the annual Blacklist this year. So that's kind of where things have been for me. Wow. That's great. Uh, so just, I just, I just want to, because some people may not know the difference. So the annual blacklist is a list that was created by Franklin Leonard quite a few years ago to um, publicize uh, Hollywood's most favorite uh, unproduced scripts. And it was sort of a survey that was sent out, I think at that time, to like 100 executives. And they all wrote up the list maybe of 10 scripts or something. And then they would just um, tally up the scripts that were mentioned the most. And then the script that got mentioned the most uh, was at the top of the list. And then the ones that were mentioned a little bit less, less, less but still enough to make the list, uh, uh, made the list. And then it was usually released toward the end of the year. And then sometime later, Leonard decided to try to monetize the list. You know, after all, he's putting in all this work and effort and he's not really getting anything out of it. So he creates the Blacklist website which is where screenwriters can, uh, uh, for a fee, have their scripts rated and perhaps publicized uh, uh, for access to industry people. So while the website is sort of an offshoot of uh, the annual list, it's very, very different. One is really more uh, pay to play and the other is, is sort of based well, in the beginning, it was, re you know, really based on sort of your work. Now, not that I'm taking away from anything, but now a lot of it is, a lot of it is politics, you know, a lot of it is sort of how hard your manager, your agent works to make sure that people read your script. Because really, in order to get your script on that annual blacklist, people have to read it. Enough people have to read it. And, um, and so, uh, uh, you know, so you really do need, uh, uh, a rabbi uh, out there to, to, you know, really to be promoting your work. Unless, of course, the work just sort of, you know, kind of combusts, which it can. You know, a lot of works can just kind of spontaneously combust on their own and then everybody wants to read it. Um, uh, again, look, getting on that list, it, I work in Hollywood. I don't care how anything is achieved. 
you know, it's just, it's just about getting it done. And, um, but so I'm really glad to hear that you had some success on the uh, Blacklist website, Lexi. And now it'll be interesting to hear if David sort of had a similar trajectory. Um, so David, why don't you tell your story? Yeah, thank you. I, I I don't know if Lexi was done telling her story. Uh, yeah, I'm done. Go ahead. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Just wanted to make sure. Just wanted to double check. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, I grew up in New York with my grandparents. Uh, my grandfather was the one who exposed me to movies. He had I, I don't know half a dozen bookshelves full of like those classic martial arts movies, the kung fu stuff, and I became a huge fan of Jackie Chan and and all that jazz. He also you know, for better or for worse, stuck me into a lot of R-rated movies in theaters. Uh, one of my <laughs> earliest memories is uh, Pulp Fiction in, like, opening weekend when I was about six. So that was cool. Uh, luckily, I didn't know what was going on for most of it. But all that to say that he he really got me into, into films. And <clears throat> even as a kid, I was already doing a lot of writing, short stories, poetry. I had these really – I had stick figure, like, graphic novels that I was drawing up. Uh, and even then, when I was about eight years old, every page was supposed to represent a minute. So I was already kind of in that mindset. Uh, and they, they came out to about 90 or so pages. It was really ridiculous. And they were usually sequels to Twister. Uh, so I drew a lot of tornadoes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, flash forward in, I would say, high school, I, or rather like on my way to college, I had a scholarship to play football. Um, I was captain of the football team in high school, co-president of the poetry club all that weird stuff. And, uh, but I, I was working at, I ended up quitting football. I just fell out of love with, with playing it. I still watch it, but I, I fell out of love with playing it. And I had to, I had to switch schools cause I lost my scholarship. And so when I came back to Brooklyn, um, I started working at Blockbuster just to kind of have a job, but also something that was like, you know, movie centric um, because I, I had that kind of low key love for it. And I watched Blade Runner for the first time, which I rented because they had the 20, 25th anniversary in 2007. Um, and that's when I was 19. And <laughs> so I, yeah, I saw that. It just kind of clicked, you know, the, the history I had with movies and, and my propensity to, to, to write stories kind of did one of these. I don't know why it took so long, but I realized what I wanted to do with my life and that was to write movies. So, you know, my way of kind of, you know, immersing myself in that business and, and, um, uh, trying to build this network and, and, and kind of get the lay of the land was first I had an, I had an internship at Mandalay vision or it used to be called Mandalay. I think it's called Maven now um, with a, 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 something, something retro, but uh, I kind of parlayed that into working on set as a PA. So I, I know that struggle very much. Some, some of the worst days of my life ever were as a PA on set. And um, you know, eventually that kind of transitioned over to script supervising, working in post, all these different things just to kind of, I mean, I, I was just looking for any route to kind of uh, building a, a career in the entertainment industry. Eventually I moved to LA in 2017. Um, and in 2019, I, I wrote some, you know, effort scripts that were very transitional for me. Uh, I, I should mention that, you know, during this time, ever since I first dis essentially discovered what, what screenwriting was, I started making some friends online, you know, whether it was over at Trigger Street Labs, some people may may recognize that name, or uh, Talentville, which was a different one, and just kind of just kind of kept leveling up, you know, kind of honing my voice and going through different phases as a writer between thinking I was a shit and realizing that I I so was not. Um, so that was very fun. But yeah, 2020 I wrote is when I wrote, uh, you know, some some of my best stuff and, and I uh, kind of sat on Clementine for a while. And in 2021, I'd say early, I had some friends read it and they had a really great response to it, took some notes. And then, you know, fast forward, I, yeah, I had a very similar uh, experience with the Blacklist website where uh, Clementine got a nine out of 10. And um, that led to, thank you, that led to, you know, some people were very, I posted that on Twitter. Some people were intrigued. So they read it and they shouted it out, which I thought was really great. And I'm always grateful for that stuff. And, you know, some people, you know, there were some executives who messaged me on the Blacklist website and some people who emailed me, people, some managers were, you know, they DM'd me on Twitter. And, uh, but it was also, you know, partially just me kind of hustling and, and, you know, making people 
aware of it, people that I knew in the industry, just making them very, you know, really privy to what was going on. So uh, that led to me signing with my amazing manager, Mitchell Bendersky over at Gramercy Park. And then eventually uh, with Verve later down the line. So uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of my, that's kind of my story. Well, interesting. And there are some common denominators in that you both worked in the industry, maybe in yeah. different capacities, but um, David, you certainly sound like you're a little bit of a hustler that, you know, that, that <laughs> oh, like, yeah. you know, and I mean that of course with the highest of compliments because one needs to be a hustler in this business. And, um, and so you have uh, sort of used uh, social media to your advantage to create a network of people, it seems. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just very fortuitous, rather, uh, with the amount of amazing friends I've been able to make on, on social media, especially on, on Twitter. Um, I could not have foreseen that at all. The only reason I even created the Twitter was because one year I was a semifinalist for Script Pipeline, and I, you know I I learned that they announced their finalists on Twitter, and I was like, well, now I need to go on Twitter to find out what's going on, uh, and you know the rest is kind of history. So yeah, you know I've just been very lucky that uh, people really, you know, have been really cool to me, and they've been they've responded to my work. I've been able to respond to their work, and and uh, you know at that time it, everything kind of aligned. So many things went right around the time where I, you know, quote unquote broke in. Um, and one of those things was the shout outs that I got on Twitter. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think that there is a lot to be said about social media. Lexi, do you use social media? Um, very, very sparingly. I only use Twitter these days. I've kind of taken myself off everything else just for my mental health. And it's done tremendous things for my creativity. But I agree, and I am doing a much more work now this year in particular with regards to building up relationships. Um, it feels like it's easier to do now again, like after the last couple, three years. So I'm reaching out to my people that I've you know, known and have met and uh, I'm trying to better leverage those relationships. Because yeah, it's 100% it's true. You can have the talent and you can have the work to back it up, but you have to also have the instinct of how to get it out there. And obviously David, does that extremely well. Yeah. So uh, you. you might want to give a course on, you know, how to. <laughs> I'll tweet you, dude. We'll media. talk. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk. Number, number uh, one rule is just be cool. Just be Right? Cool. Yes. Like, don't <laughs> ask for things. Just, like, just be cool. Be nice. Just, Seriously, like, just chill and yes. be cool. <laughs> yeah. But uh, now, you know, I'm, I'm not on Twitter, uh, uh, and so I don't, I don't interact with that. I don't exact. I know how it works a tiny bit, but, um, but, but so do you, do you, do you make yourself known to the people that you follow? So at the very least they recognize your name, for example, or. Is that a question for Alexandra or myself? Either of you, sure. Okay. Do you want to go first? Uh, sure. I, I, I do a bit of both. Um, I don't reach out to people just to say like, hey, my name is Lexi, I'm a writer too. I reach out to people if I have a specific question. So I mentioned that I, you know, in preparation for this interview, I watched a few of your previous ones. I watched the one with Meg LaFove and she mentioned that she records uh, all of her notes sessions. So I found her on Twitter. I already followed her, but for some reason I wasn't like seeing her, her feed. And I tweeted her and I was like, hey, out of curiosity, what do you use to record your note sessions? Because I've had that, that same instinct, but I've had a problem accomplishing it. Um, and she tweeted back with what she does. So that's kind of the way that I prefer to do it. I reach out with a specific question or a compliment and I'm not intending to get anything back. It's just me saying, hey, I appreciate what you do or I've got a question about what you do. And that's it. There's nothing behind it really. And if they respond, great. They usually do because people want to, give back. Writers especially, I think, writers really want to give back. And that's how you form relationships, for me at least. I think you bring up a great point about the intent. You know, you don't want to have, uh, you don't want to have, uh, the phrase escapes me, uh, but alter alternative, ulterior motives, I think that's what I'm talking about. You know, you know, people can see through that, you know. Um, it, everything kind of has to be genuine. There has to be kind of a, a genuine curiosity and also just uh, a need to create relationships and become friends with people. I've never, I, I can't think of a time where I set out to just try and get reads. Um, I think what happened is I, 
I, as a lot of people do on Twitter and, and, you know, other platforms, they just kind of post their wins. Oh yeah. Top 10 and big break or what have you, or, Oh my God, nickel, that kind of thing. And, um, that led to, um, that led to meeting people, you know, a lot of, a lot of people see those things, especially when they're, when they're aware of when the announcements are, that kind of thing. There was also, I, I, again, you know, speaking about just like kind of the, the, the fortune uh, in 2020, I wrote the script called Bear Skull that a lot of people seem to really respond to. And, and uh, there was some shout outs. And so I was, I was exposed to a lot of people uh, that way. <clears throat> and that led to, so there was, it's kind of a combination of posting the wins, congratulating other people on their wins, which is literally one of my favorite things, just regardless. It's like, it's just, I just kind of, I get a kick out of that. That's a whole other conversation. Um, I just love being a cheerleader for people. And I think I think those three facets of like posting the wins, congratulating, being there for when people are kind of down, when they're sad, you know, be like, hey, man, you got this. Um, but also having a script that, you know, if you're if you've worked on it hard enough and but also if you're lucky that people really respond to and and uh, are shouting it from the mountaintop. It's, it's very important in this industry to have champions. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of it was kind of a combination of those three things. So twenty twenty was a very pivotal year for me and like you know social media in general. Can you both talk about your experience with the blacklist website and sort of you know the, the uh, um, your script got a nines for example. So what yeah. did that mean? How did you uh, um, did you interface with people? Were people reaching out to you? Uh, was that how you got your manager, for example? So, you know, just kind mm. of do a riff on that. Lexi, you want to yeah. go first? Okay. Oh, please. Uh, I mean, David sounds like he's got an answer, so yeah. I'd love to actually hear his first. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know what our system is yet, but uh, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll play it by ear. There, but, um, there, there is no system. <laughs> okay. No. Yeah, the only reason I was going to answer is because you mentioned the nine. I, I don't know if uh, Alexander had... I had a nine or if, who are you talking to? So I assumed it was me, my bad. But, um, but yeah, no, it, it, it's actually a really funny story. And like I said, there were a lot of other things happening around the same time. Uh, there was this culmination of like being a semifinalist at Austin and which made me go to Austin and like, you know, stuff with like cover jank. And it was just, it was chaos. Uh, but the blacklist, the nine, that was the, the biggest component of it. And so, the funny story is that, you know, I was talking to my best friend, Jason. Um, he's also a great writer, WGA, um, sold and had a huge spec sale a few years ago. But we talk every day. We're like, we're like basically husbands. Like we, you know, he has his wife and everything. And, and <laughs> sure, I'm straight too. But like, let's just, let's be honest here. Like we're, just, we're married. So um, we talk every day. And so one night he was just like, I guess he was drunk or something. And he was just like, hey, man, I just... I have some extra cash. I'm just going to get some evals on the Blacklist website. And because whenever he jumps off a bridge, I tend to also strongly consider jumping off that bridge as well. Um, I also got some evals. And, you know, it was around that time that I, I finally, I don't know why, but I was sitting on Clementine for like so long and I barely showed it with people. But I was like, all right, well, the few people who have read it, they, they seem to really enjoy it. So, you know, I guess I'll also get drunk and, and submit it into the Blacklist website. And uh, I, by that point, I'd never gotten an eight at all. I don't think I'd even gotten a seven, if I'm being completely honest with you. But uh, two days later, it came back with a nine out of ten, which was absurd. Um, I, I couldn't believe it. And then literally, there was, I think that same day, it also had a six. And I was like, oh, okay, interesting. And then the next day, it got another eight. Uh, and I was like, oh, boy. So here, here we go. But as far as, like, the, the process, be, you know, from, from kind of spinning that into any kind of success, um, it was a lot of hustling on my part, to be honest. Um, yes, I, I had a funny story where like Christmas Day, a producer messaged me on the blacklist, like in the message inbox, which I thought was interesting asking if it was available. But I think I, I had a couple of friends I'd known in the industry just from like networking. Uh, I had a best friend who was working at, I think, WB at the time, or it might have been Sony. I, I forget. I, I don't know where he is now, but I made him aware of it. I, you know, people who had, I had queried who responded before I messaged and who like, I kind of kept a rapport with, I messaged them, I let, you know, let them know, uh, Joey over at Roadmap, who I, who I, who I knew pretty well because I had gotten some consultations a few years back 
but also people had recommended a couple of scripts of mine to him. So I was on his radar. I let him know as well as like some folks like literally everywhere. Uh, but, you know, posting the nine on say Twitter, again, posting those wins made people aware and then they, they got curious and asked to read it. And then if they loved it, they would shout it out on Twitter. And then because of that, more people kept reading it. Uh, there were so many like tweets and retweets about the script, which is, I, I can't thank them enough. And that led to some managers DMing me on Twitter, which was really cool. So uh, I met with about 12 managers around that time. Um, and, you know, half of them wanted to work with me. A few others wanted to keep reading more stuff, all this. And, and uh, I was just very lucky around that time to, to, to meet with so many great people. But that's how I ended up. I just was really drawn to Mitchell because of his passion, you know. So, uh, but yeah, I think hopefully that's a clear, you know, description of how that went down. Yes, it is. It is. Thank you. And Lexi? Well, so my experiences could not be more different. Um, <laughs> right. Like, I mean, like, look, I think my, my stance on the Blacklist website is that it's extremely democratizing and that I think, yeah, it's pay to play, but everything is. The only way you're going to get people with actual experience and clout to read this work as an evaluator is to pay them to do it. And you have to therefore pay to, you know, keep the website running. Um, and if you don't have contacts and you don't have anybody that you can send things to in the industry, which I didn't at the time, like I, I couldn't go into the industry after I graduated college. All my friends who did go into it were, you know, low level PAs or they were struggling, you know, to even get their bosses to read their own scripts, let alone somebody else's script. So I submitted a couple projects to the Blacklist website, never got more than a six on any of them. Um, the last one I ever submitted was uh, my feature, What a Doll, which is a biopic about the creator of the Barbie doll. And I submitted it. And before I even got an evaluation, I got a notification that it was downloaded. It was only ever downloaded once. And it was by my current manager. And she got in touch wow. the very next day. And she said, I love this. I'd love to talk to you. Here's And she introduced herself with her credibility and her credits, which a lot of uh managers don't have you know if you don't know anybody who's re watching this right now anyone can hang up a shingle and say that they're a manager there's very few people who actually like have the clout and the credit and you should always check because I've definitely been burning with a previous manager who didn't have any of that but so we talked the next day and she immediately got me she got what I wanted to do she had notes obviously um, and I decided to work with her then and there Thereafter, I got my six on that script. <laughs> and with a write-up, which, which literally I still have, and it said like, this is an extremely impressive script written by a writer of, you know, amazing professional talent. And it was like, it was beautiful. It was beautiful, like, you know, espousing my talents, but a six, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> it's subjective and that's the truth, but anyone worth their salt is looking for something they can build. They're not looking for a package, like a product that's complete as far as I'm concerned. They're looking for what can I work with? And if you have something that's highly rated, well, there's less work to be done. So, so much the better. But my log line was intriguing to my manager. She liked what else I had written. And when we spoke, we had a similar kind of sense of how to work together. So that's, that's what happened. We worked together. And I've never hosted anything on the website since. Um, but yeah, never more than a six. That is so oh, I love that story so much. Um, <laughs> that Kate was just like, she was just dialed in. I mean, listen, <laughs> when, when Kate calls half the time, I respond with Kate the Great. because she, <laughs> That's like, great. She's, And I will sing her phrases forever because she is dialed in. She loves story and she knows what she's doing. Well, you know, I, I, real quick, I, I also have a similar experience where, so because when you get like a nine or an eight, you get, you, you earn some free evaluations. So between the, those two ratings, I had gotten free evals. And by then, I didn't really care. It's just like I was just trying to – I had a lot going on because of that first – that initial nine. But I did get, like, I don't know, like four sevens after that. And, like, two of those sevens were the, the most praise Clementine <laughs> could ever – like, the script could ever get. And I was like, really? Like, if you compare those, those words to the words of the, what I got from even the nine, it's, like, not even close – uh, there was one seven that was like, Screen Jam, you should pick this up immediately. It's ready to go. <laughs> da, 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 da. And it's like, dude, you gave me a seven. What are we What's going on here? So that, I just wanted to echo that same uh, experience. Yeah, that's very yeah. amusing. Um, but I think, like Lexi said, it's so 
it's so subjective. But I think it can be frustrating if the numbers don't sort of match the praise, right? Because if you feel like this should be picked up by a production company and you're only giving it a seven, uh, the problem with that is that if it's a seven, it tends to get a little buried uh, at the website as opposed to giving it an eight or a nine or a 10 where it can kind of rise to the top. So it's a little bit of a disconnect, I guess. Um, but ultimately it was enough, it seems like for sort of both of you to, to just kind of ride the momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems like it was really that it wasn't the sort of end of your journey, but it was certainly a very big boost uh, into your journey. Um, yeah, it was a catapult for sure. It was a catapult, yeah. It I to introduce you to your manager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what I keep learning is that there is no such thing as making it. There's always that <laughs> next girl, right? Like even now, like we've both been on the 2022 blacklist, like, annual like list. That's a huge achievement. I certainly am still writing that high. And we're now trying to, you know, find a partner for that script. But it doesn't mean that the phone is ringing off the hook with offers to do, you know, rewrites here and this WOWA because there's so many amazing writers and there's only so many jobs. So, yes, it's a feather in the cap. And yes, it's a great thing for the resume. But you're always still pushing towards the next thing, the next script. That's how it works. Yeah, yeah I have a really good, my really good friend Lily always describes it as like you have to constantly climb Everest. Like every, <laughs> once you get to the top, there's a, you get there and you realize there's another Everest that you, you now have to climb. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it is very challenging. Yeah, very, very few people, it seems, uh, uh, have it easy. So even if you sell a script and have the movie made, that's great, but you have to start all over again each each and every time you sort of have to go back to go, you know, mm -hmm. maybe you get to collect your $200, but you're still sort of back at the beginning again. Um, hopefully the view is different uh, <laughs> than it was previously, but still, it's still always a slog, you know, it's still, it's, it's, it's such uh, uh, it's like Sisyphus, but landing on the annual blacklist is certainly a, uh, uh, it's your name sort of in lights, yes. you know, for, for, uh, for scripts, because, you know, there are, obviously there are uh, writers who uh, are much, much farther along in their career who have their, you know, these scripts land on the blacklist. And then there are brand new writers and, and uh, but it certainly helps the script. It certainly gives a lot of life to the script. Uh, yeah, one thing, a couple of things I'll, I'll say is like, so literally the, the week of the Blacklist announcement, people were like, so what's happening? Like, what, what's, has anything happened since being on the Blacklist? And it's like, really? The same, like a week later? Like, uh, I, I expect if anything does, it, it would take months. I mean, I'm sure if people are reading it, they, people take weeks to read one script. I'm sure there are many people reading multiple scripts off the Blacklist. Um, so, you know, I, I keep the expectations pretty, pretty chill. Uh, with that said, you know, there are a couple of things that, that have happened recently where there have been a couple of directors. So it, you know, Clementine was optioned back in last February, like a year ago. Um, and the, ever since the blacklist, you know, announcement, they've made it like a priority. It's very exciting. And they're just as excited as I am. And some of the people that, you know, some of the directors, namely that they've sent it to, you know, it, it seems like there is that chance that it has moved the needle as far as moving it up the pile or like, especially when I go in for pitches on OWAs, it's like, there's a chance that I'm the only writer, you know, pitching on this project that's on the blacklist. And, and, you know, you never know. It could probably people, you know, people are aware of it. My team has done an amazing job at <clears throat> educating everyone on my deal. So there are like these like kind of small wins that aren't necessarily as palpable to, you know, the masses or people who are on the outside, it's, 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 it's a lot more nuanced uh, than that. But um, I think, you know, I think over the course of the year, yeah, it'll, it'll help the majority of the people who are on that list for sure. Can yeah, you... I definitely not to discount, sorry, not, not to discount the list at all. It, it definitely does help. Um, it's just a, a matter of, you know, it is, it, it, 
as you said, it's a list of the favorite scripts of the year, right? No one could say it's the best script of the year because best is subjective, but it's favorites. It means enough people remembered your script after the literal hundreds they've read over the course of the year to give it one of their, like, you know, I think it's like, what, 10 votes for someone gets? Yeah, somewhere between the, five and 10, I think. Thousand scripts they have to <laughs> read over the year, and that is not nothing. If, if your script resonates with someone, that to me is, is the win that I take to fuel me into the next day because nothing is guaranteed and scripts might not get made. That doesn't mean that you're a bad writer, but to know that something resonated enough that they remembered it, that is something that I can take forward. It makes the next script easier, at least. It makes me trust my instincts more. Mm. Because, oh, okay, well that one worked and I really leaned into this element of you know, my process, therefore I can lean into it further in the next script. Well, that's a big I, I, win. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think you brought up. I think you you've reminded me. I think that's you brought up so many great points there. Of like, just what it represents. Like every exec is completely burnt out. They're jaded. Yeah. They have so many scripts, <laughs> and some of them they like don't even have a ch like their opinion doesn't even matter. But they're still forced to read it. Yeah. And so for them to remember to for them, I, I you know I spoke to one exec who disclosed to me that she had five votes. I, I, I don't know if more other people have more or less or what have you, but mm. just for, you know, Clementine to be in that five is like insane for any yeah. one person. You know, if you're getting, if you got one blacklist vote, that's incredible. <laughs> now you need six to, you know, qualify or what have you. But I think also that same week I was developing a pitch and I was so inspired, you know, I felt so confident and kind of reinvigorated and not that I, you know, was, wasn't already feeling motivated, but it just kind of, it was, it was like a multiplier. It was like an amplifier. You know, it was like, Oh man, I'm, I'm, this is like, I am, you know, I'm so ready. I'm going to crush this pitch because I'm a blacklist writer now. It's like, it's like, it's my duty to absolutely crush this. So, um, and the other thing that, uh, what, what Lexi said that I was reminded of is like how important it is to celebrate those wins. Cause they are, once you're on the other side, they are fewer and further between um, and so when you have anything happening, you, you literally have to be good at celebrating it. And my, my team is very good at like reminding me of that too. My manager is always like, just FYI, this is a huge win. Even if they pass, they're still huge fans of yours, huge win, yeah. you know? So I think that's extremely important, uh, for writers to do now. Don't get over, like, don't get over, don't get overconfident and don't, you know, put place too much of a premium on like your cover fly percentage with all due respect, but like, <laughs> you just got to be, you got to be really good at like acknowledging what, what's a win and what isn't and how it's celebrated. We're going to have to write that down. Cover fly percentage. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> um, Perfect. Even we better. We can get to that later. But <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so leading up to the announcement of the blacklist, did you, uh, because I honestly don't know how this works. It's like, it's like when people get nominated for an Oscar it's not like it comes out of the blue because they have been campaigning. The studio has been putting up money. You know, maybe it's a, a you know, it's a grassroots campaign, but you know, you have to put your name in to be nominated for an Oscar. You have to pick the category that you will want to be put into. And, and so there's a little bit of uh, advanced work that has to be done. So in regards to the blacklist, like, do you have an inkling? Is there a, is there a suspicion? Does somebody say to you, oh, I think your script's going to be on the, the, or, you know, are you just sort of out and about and somebody calls you and says, hey, I was just watching the live announcement and they read your name. I mean, like, how does that work? So I can illustrate this for you and you can look at my Twitter account and you can see the proof for yourself. Um, everyone knows the day that they're announced because it's, they make a big deal out of it. Like, you know, on this day, this, it's usually the Friday before everyone closes down yes. for the holidays in December. So, okay, on this Friday, at, you know, this time, PST, they're going to announce the blacklist. So I remember that morning, um, they were, I think, already announcing it or they were about to. And I just tweeted, congratulations to all the 2022 blacklist <laughs> members. I'm so happy for you. Congratulations. And I closed my computer when I bought my day. I opened it back up a little bit later and, I, and my notifications were blowing up and I don't get a lot of action on Twitter. And so I saw that my name had been called and I retweeted, you know, myself, oh shit, like, I didn't know. I had no idea that I was on the list. And my manager called a minute later and we both like, we were, ah, you know, girl screaming, ah. And I asked her, did you know? And she said, no. And so when she gets a call 
from the blacklist, you know, whoever someone's uh, verifying information, the Twitter handles of people, their names, spellings, whatever, whatever, they throw in false positives. So not even the managers know who makes the list until the list is announced. Interesting. Yeah, I had a very similar uh, <clears throat> experience where, so I, it, what was funny is that around November-ish, I like very randomly, I was like doing jury duty or something stupid. And I just remember being like, hey, wait a minute, doesn't the blacklist get announced in like three weeks? And I was like, oh no, I don't want to think about it. Like, I don't want to like, I don't, you know, I, and then leading up to it, I just like, I was, I, I was very lucky to be almost like too busy, like, you know, developing the pitches and like, and with meetings and, and I think I was started writing a pilot or something. And so I was very distracted. Like, like I completely forgot about it. Unfortunately, my friends did not. So the Friday before the announcement, they were just like, dude, you know what's going to happen, right? You know it's going to be on there, right? I'm like, shut up. Like, wait, I, I just can't, I can't get excited and be anxious about the possibilities of being on there because that's like a dream come true, you know? So that Monday, I, 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 don't, I don't know if it was a Friday or a Monday it was, it was announced. I, I thought it might have been a Monday, but um, my commute to work was terrible. And, I, and then, like, there was all the stuff at my, because I still have my day job. And I just, it was just, it, it just was just a horrible morning. And I just remember going back into my office and my phone was already ringing and I had like five emails and one of which was from my team. Uh, and then I was like, Oh, this must've happened. And so that's how I found out. And so one of my agents said something in the email thread that made it definitely sound like he didn't know until it was announced. I mean, yes, they campaign, but they probably, my guess is that the majority of, of representatives don't know what's going to happen until it happens. So uh, yeah, very similar experience where uh, it's like, it was just a surprise. It makes it better though, that it's a surprise. It does. Like, it, it, does. <laughs> it really does. does. And honestly, like if you don't make it, it's not like a knock on your writing. It's like, there's only Seriously. so many people make it, but to make it and you're like, well, holy crap. Like this is, this is everything I've worked for, like for so many years. And it means so much. It's such an accolade. And I am still riding that high. It's been months now, almost four months. And I'm still like, Woo-hoo! yeah. We're still going. Absolutely. I mean, it might be years. (laughs) We're going to write this high for forever, probably. (laughs) The first thing I did was message all my favorite execs and be like, so I'm now a Blacklist writer. Yes. I'm curious to meet up with you at the top of the year and see what the new company mandates are. You know, like... Yeah, it would, and sometimes they'll congratulate you. And I've had a couple of even mm-hmm. tell me, it just FYI, I voted for you. Just, you know. Just, yeah, you know. Yes. Oh my gosh, thank you. Like, yeah. Right. Fun. So, so, you know, David, your friends sort of were teasing you and maybe yes. sort of had a little bit of an inkling. But, but where, did, where does that inkling come from? Is it because they know that the script was so hot around town <laughs> that, you know, it had a lot of good word of mouth? What? You know, because there are a lot of people that have their scripts circulating town, right? But w- are they even thinking that their script could get on the blacklist? So was it that your script had such kind of a great word of mouth or, or you know, what was it that sort of made your friends think that you could get on the illustrious blacklist? That's actually, that's actually a really good question. So uh, I think by that time I had had about... Um, and this is not a flex or anything, but I'd, ha- I'd had about 85 generals by then. And and so my really, really close-knit group of friends were the only ones that kind of knew that just because we were like, you know, shooting shit or what have you. And they were just like, well, based on those numbers, wouldn't it make sense if you were on the blacklist? They were just like, they, they just yeah. applied logic to it. Yeah. And I was like, can that we not makes sense to me now. go there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, exactly. can we just not go there? <laughs> were, those, were those generals all for Clementine? The majority of them were for Clementine. Some of them were for my pilot cyber gun, but I would say ninety percent of them were for for Clementine. Wow, that's incredible! Congrats, that's huge. Thank you. I, I, mean, that's I just had my one hundredth recently, actually. Just yeah. like this past that's a lot. 100th. That's a lot yeah. of meetings. And as I said earlier, yes. it, you know, it is in a sense a popularity contest, right? Because people have to read your script in order yeah. for it to even get on the blacklist. Enough people sort of have to read it. And, and so if somebody's going out on that many meetings, then to me, that makes sense. And of course, a person who's going on that amount of meetings, clearly the script is getting a good word of mouth also. Uh, so Yeah. 
Okay. It, it is important to know that like popularity in there was a lot of overlap between popularity and like maybe quality, you know, like people are really responding to it's a wonderful story because chances are it's a great script. So that's why, you know, it, it is, yes, the list isn't the a list of best because the reason I have to say that is because people are just like going in with, with hater eight eyes. It is what it that's is. Right. And they're going to, they're going to hold the, you know, number one to such a really insane standard because they're, they're kind of projecting their, their woes and their, their feelings <laughs> against, against the list. Um, which is, you know, not necessarily the most unhealthy thing. You kind of have to, you kind of have to be a little delusional as a writer to, to, to do, to get anything going. Uh, but it, it, popularity is very important in this industry because you kind of also have to give off really good vibes. And that's why reps meet you first before they sign you typically. Um, so a lot more goes into it than just the script. Yeah. And, and um, again, it's like, who cares how it gets done? And ultimately popularity o- will only get it so far anyway. Right. Because yeah. the minute that people have to sign a check, Exactly. That really becomes about so many other things. Uh, is the script good? Can it attract talent? Uh, can we get it made? Yeah, you know, there's a gazillion other factors that go into it. But this is a town, ta- you know, this is a town about popularity. You yeah. know, it, it that's what this business thrives on. So, um, and I think that's what's great about the blacklist. But most certainly, uh, uh, you know. I think you know, I'm not sure that I've ever read a script that was on the blacklist where I was like, Oh God, that was awful. Um, <laughs> yeah. I honestly don't think Same. so because ultimately <laughs> it's my peers, you know, that are putting these scripts on to the list anyway, you know, and we all kind of tend to think of like, you know, we're all kind of looking at material the same way and, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, now you can't say the same thing maybe about nickel winning scripts. Because, <laughs> you know, be, well, be, because you know it's a contest. You know it's a contest, mm. and and so I, I think that can tend to be a little more of a mixed bag. Where uh, when you're talking about the blacklist, uh, it's really gone through some v- incredibly rigorous vetting. Those scripts have yeah. really been vetted by by executives, you know, by a lot of people perhaps who make very important kinds of decisions. Um, So, uh, and and there's no doubt about it. At the end of the year, people look at that blacklist script and, um, you know, uh, I work at WME and you know, we get uh, 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 a link to, you know, all of of those blacklist scripts, you know, all of them. And so, and, you know, we've got two weeks to read as many as we would like. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so it definitely gets promoted in a very, in a very big way, uh, in a very big way. Plus there's always sort of news stories about it, you know, uh, mm-hmm. right. You know, like, uh, uh, if the first script on the blacklist is interesting, you know, if it's like about somebody who's famous, let's say, you know, There'll there'll be a great big news article about it. So really, uh, uh, I mean, it's a great it's a great thing that agents and managers love. They love they love to be able to say this is a blacklist writer. And this is the thing that I tell writers all the time: it's you've got to set yourself apart from other writers. You know, you have to be able to say that yeah, I'm a nickel winner or I landed on the blacklist. And that's really hard. That's really hard to do yeah. because I, there's only a fraction of people that can say it, but those are the things that aspiring writers have to be struggling to achieve, have to be, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's a function of business, you know? Like everyone who's in this industry is trying to justify their decisions to their boss. That's just the way that all Mm. businesses work, right? So, and with writing, especially in filmmaking, you know, you you can only look at so much and say, okay, we think this will work, and you never really know if it will or won't until the movie is literally like, you know, at its opening weekend, right? So you do what you can to stack the odds in your favor. You get a writer that has proven with various accolades and various, you know, this is a justifiable thing. We can say this is a good writer. It's a blacklist writer. It's a nickel winner. It's an AFF winner. 
this writer can write. Okay, cool. Then you find a director, same thing. It's a Sundance finalist, you know, whatever. That's how things get done. So as much as it sucks to say that, oh, well, you know, like everything is subjective, you do have to find a way to quantify your work as opposed to everybody else's. And that's, Absolutely. Because that's then, then somebody has already done the work for the executive. That's yes. sort of the way people mm -hmm. will see it. Well, if the script is on the blacklist, mm -hmm. then it has to be good. And mm -hmm. a lot of people in this town tend to second guess themselves and they're always worried about what other people are thinking. Well, if a script is on the blacklist, well, I know how everybody feels about it. <laughs> That's I, so true. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, can, can, can you each tell us a little bit, or at least as much as you can, uh, about your blacklist script? Mm -hmm. You know, like a log line or whatever. Dave, you want to go first? Sure. Yeah. So mine, it, I, I don't have a, I, I'm not even going to try to say a log line right now, but I, I'll just describe what happens. So basically <clears throat> it's a crime thriller called Clementine. Uh, it's uh, it takes place all in real time and you know, it could be shot in one take that kind of, it could be that kind of endeavor, but basically <laughs> it, it opens up with a, a failed deadly pawn shop heist. And there's only one survivor of the shootout. And we follow that survivor after she's been shot and she has to, she's owed money to the cartel uh, that day, she has to protect her daughter from from a, a hit woman who's out to collect that debt. So it's uh, it gets crazy. <laughs> All right, great and interesting that that um, the blacklist, of course, is is so much more open to uh, uh, commercial scripts, perhaps, or you know, scripts of this ilk, where something mm. like the nickel, maybe, generally speaking. Probably might, wouldn't be a core finalist. Might yeah. shine, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, all right, great. And Lexi? Um, uh, just to kind of, yeah, collaborate on that, basically. I think one of the things that you tend to see most on the blacklist is dramas, um, in the part because there's so many more people in town who are open to reading dramas. You don't see many comedies. You don't see many thrillers. So, again, testament to Dave's piece that it did so well. Um, so mine, by contrast, is a pure period piece drama. Um, it's a Wonderful Story is, it's a biopic about making of It's a Wonderful Life. And the log line, more or less, is Frank Capra and Jimmy Stewart come out of World War II and try to, and they make this movie, they make It's a Wonderful Life as a way to try to bring their lives back to normal. Um, and that's a very carefully worded uh, log line because the whole script really is an allegory for us right now coming out of the pandemic and trying to get back to sense of normalcy. Interesting. How much Love research it. did you have to do? Is it, is it, is it fairly accurate? Um, it's accurate in the broad strokes, uh, in many of the broad strokes, but oddly enough, there is very little information about the actual filming of It's a Wonderful Life, but there's plenty of information about Jimmy Stewart's life and Frank Capra's life. So this is a story that I've wanted to tell for many, many years. It's one of those movies that I watch, not every year, but every couple of years. And when I do, I tend to kind of, you know, Google it and see what the trivia is. And one of the things that stands out is that, um, one, it was Frank Capra's favorite movie and one of his last movies. Two, it was a flop, absolute flop when it came out. And three, that Jimmy Stewart, um, it was his favorite character and that's interesting because he also, uh, just before making it, was looking at leaving the business. He was going to stop wow. acting, full stop. And this movie actually turned that around and gave him another 40 years worth of career. Not because it you know, made him better, but because it made him want to act for 40 more years. So all of those pieces kind of uh, were swirling in my mind for a long time. I read, bio, I read I'm sorry, biographies and autobiographies of both men to kind of get just a background sense but I can never figure out the why now of the script. Mm. That's one of, one mm. of the questions you always get from you know, your reps and from the readers is, but why make this now? Why is it topical now? And I could never answer that until we went through COVID-19 and all of a sudden it was like, aha, there it is. Like, wow. and, and that's what propelled me to then write it. And it, I thought it was gonna be a nice three month thing because I had so much information and the whole things in my mind. It took me a year to write that script. 
Wow. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, never, <laughs> never rest on your laurels. Right. <laughs> well, you know, the blacklist loves those kinds of scripts yes. also. They, yes. they really, and I think it's because, again, look who is submitting script titles, right? They're people who work in the movie industry. So mm. they seem to gravitate towards scripts that often look at sort of the stories behind the stories of our favorite movies. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that was a strategy or, but whatever, it's sure, you know, I mean, it was very smart. Um, that's also happened to be one of my most favorite movies. Um, I went to see it this year. I took my son to see it on the big screen. You know, they were screening it at the AMC. Yeah. Right mm -hmm. around Christmas time, you know, I spent like twenty dollars to go see it, even though you mm -hmm. can watch it at home eight thousand <laughs> times. But I'm like, you know, I want to watch that movie with a crowd. I want to see yes. it with a crowd. Not only like twenty yes. people in the theater wasn't much of a crowd, but but still. Um, so I think that's great. A, two really really different sorts of projects. Um, and Lexi, I think you said I don't know if you said this to us privately or here that that your other scripts uh, are very different. Now, yes. now the, the, the Barbie script is also a little bit sort of, of like a story behind, you know, mm -hmm. well, you know, like a pop culture kind of icon. So there's a, at least a little bit of a kind of uh, a similarity there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how about that's a good other? example. Um, sorry, that's a good oh, example yeah. to bring up too for everyone who's watching. You talked about how it's so important for a writer to make themselves apart, set yourself apart from everybody else. So the, that one's called What a Doll, and um, that came about because I was looking for some bedtime reading, and I went to my library, and there was somebody had put up, you know, this biography of uh, Ruth Handler, and, or the making of Barbie. And I thought, that looks like it's interesting. And I, again, planned for it to be, you know, a few pages every night, bedtime reading. Well, that first night, I couldn't put it down, and I read the whole thing that night. And I quickly Googled it, you know, because you look for other rights are available or that someone's going to make this. And I saw that it was in development at the time, I think, with um, Reese Witherspoon. But I looked at the, the write-up in the trades of how they were going to approach it. And it looked to me, at least, like it was going to be kind of your standard, like, oh, woman in business in the 50s, how unusual. And in reading the, the biography that I did, what I picked up on was the fact that this is a woman who made this doll for her daughter to show her that in the 50s, that your peak kind of leave it to Beaver, June Cleaver, you know, your woman's job is in the house, you're a mother, you're a wife, that's your role. She made this doll to give her daughter a chance to role play any other kind of career, any other thing she wanted to be. Barbie's first roles were nurse, doctor, teacher, tennis star, because those weren't options for girls at the time. And she does it out of love for her daughter and of course, her daughter wants nothing to do with it and can't understand why her mother is not the typical June Cleaver type that she wants. And so I thought, this is a mother-daughter drama story that is timeless. And that's the way that I wrote it. And that's what got my manager interested. And she also was like, this is the perspective that I'm looking for, that people are looking for. It's not your typical woman in business fighting the man. It's, it's the drama that's in the relationships. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was again similar drama. I love dramas. Dramas are my thing. Um, <laughs> but uh, but and Ramesh read another one that I have, which is it's it's Rocky about a 15 year old black girl who wants to swim. You know, that's the way I describe it. So I live yeah. in the space of um, characters who are caught between who they're supposed to be and who they want to be. That's my personal brand, and that spans all of the different subgenres of drama as I understand them. So uh, my guess is, and I apologize if I'm wrong, but perhaps neither of you check the Caucasian box on, you know, any kind <laughs> of like governmental forms. I, and, I check whatever is available. I'm mixed, you know, and I'm, I'm obviously white passing and I, I own that. So um, I own both sides of my identity. Good. Hey, mm -hmm. you know, work it however you need to. And, uh, <laughs> but, but it does, does that inform your writing at all? Um, you know, clearly you're writing a script about a black girl who wants to swim. Um, or, you know, are you, are you addressing ethnicity in your work or are you just writing whatever you want to write? Well, for me, um, it, it always comes from the character's internal motivations 
occasionally race does play a part in it because race does inform how you live and work and, and move in this world. And yes, I do like to write lots of characters of color because we should be normalizing characters of color in stories that aren't just trauma-based, right? And that aren't specific mm -hmm. to like, here's a black person's story, right? Or an Asian person's story. I like to put those characters in roles that you wouldn't think, you know, to put them necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but Black Girls Don't Swim was very loosely inspired by a real situation. I read a little article about um, these Somali American girls because there's a huge population of Somali Americans in Minnesota. And these are the girls who are now first generation Americans and they want to participate in like sports and they want to do things that American girls do. But a lot of that does not mesh with their culture and their religion. And so it's about how do you, how do you get to be the all American girl, but also retain your identity and who you are. And that's what that story explores. And the way I approached that was, you know, like my father is a Polish immigrant. My mother's African American. I'm dual citizen. I speak both languages. I'm married to a Vietnamese man. I, I approach all my different families and all my different um, worlds with a different perspective. And I see the similarities between them. I see how my Polish family is exactly like my Vietnamese in-laws and how my black family is exactly like my Polish family, right? Mm -hmm. Like I see similarities that are not there on the surface, but are there within uh, deeper cultural context. And that's how I approach those characters. Interesting. You seem to have sort of a similar sense to a filmmaker I like. Um, um, uh, now I'm having, of course, I'm having a uh, senior moment. Um, <laughs> uh, um, it happens. Oh, uh, Jane Anderson. Oh my goodness. Thank you. I like Jane Anderson. You kind of seem to have a little bit of like her sensibility, I think, mm -hmm. um, which is a very big compliment for me. David? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, first, just to kind of, um, I, I, Lexi, I love that answer. And also, it, it, it also reminds me of how important it is uh, to imbue your stories with life experience and why life experience is, is uh, such a great tool in storytelling. So uh, for me, it's it's kind of the the other hand where I, I'm, I'm more so just kind of write whatever I, whatever movies I want to watch, you know, um, mm -hmm. You know, Ramesh. I, I'm, also, I'm also very grateful that Ramesh read a few other things as well, including like Bear Skull. I think it's Cyber Gun, and they're totally different from Clementine. <laughs> like Cyber Gun is my first love is sci-fi. So, and Cyber Gun is like completely. I mean, you know, humanity is like living in the internet, and they're like so these humanoid viruses and all this stuff. And I'm so influenced by you know movies like Blade Runner and, and um, Gattaca and Brazil, mm -hmm. all those kind of things. So, and um, I, I'm very, you know, one word, one phrase that gets tossed around a lot and, you know, probably for, for the better is genre agnostic. I'm very genre agnostic. Uh, but as far as like when it comes to my, you know, how my identity, my nationality um, is represented in stories, it's probably usually through the characters. And oftentimes, especially with, say, I probably pull from just my you know just from being a dude um probably just like <laughs> my masculinity like i i've written stories about you know um you know kind of growing up as like a teenage boy just being really confused about how you're supposed to behave and all those things and you know your crushes and all that stuff and and just like kind of just becoming a man and <clears throat> and knowing what you know realizing the importance of opening up and and you know addressing your mental health those kind of things so um, I do deal with OCD, so that's like a that's also like a, a thing that I kind of I kind of infuse into into stories. So, um, but I don't necessarily, and not to say that anyone else does, but I don't I don't necessarily. They're they're typically not kind of you know fused into the conceit of of what I'm trying to write. It's more of like a uh, I find little little you know the different elements of the story are probably going to be inspired by those 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 things. Uh, but in general, you know, whenever I start to write something, I don't necessarily consider my own rate, you know, ethnicity and, and stuff like that, uh, or nationality. Um, but it also depends on the story, but typically that's not, um, I'm, I'm more of a just like, we we're in space now kind of guy. Right. And, you know, I don't really know if that was a fair or even appropriate question. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, we sort of are in this world now where we uh, are focusing on diversity more, trying to be more attentive to it, doing what we should have done, you know, a hundred years ago. 
Uh, I think it's a fair question, just for the record. I, I, I think, so. I, think that, okay. I also and like I, that we had different yeah. answers to kind of. All right, cool. And I, I, I'm sorry. I hope you don't mind, Chris. I, I love what you said, Dave. And I'm, I'm curious. Do you watch? Sorry. Do you watch Star Trek Discovery? Because no, I no. love what they do with Discovery, as far as it's full of characters of color, but we never have to address it. The focus love is it. on the sci-fi and on the adventure. <laughs> And we never have to worry about like, well, what's this person's particular trauma and whatever. And, and I think it's yes. interesting too, because when you're a writer of color, or at least you identify that way, people come to you expecting you to want to write only about that and to have to tell them that, well, no, really, and my focus is like, I love science fiction and I'm all about you know the, that genre agnostic. That's not what people expect, especially with, like you said, Chris, the focus on diversity. I've definitely had projects come to me where I've taken myself out of the running saying, this is a great project, but you're looking for a certain level of lived experience that I don't have. Mm -hmm. And it would be disingenuous of me to try to create, you know, this narrative for you. Um, and it sucks that we have to have a kind of conversation, but we do. Uh, and so I think it's a fine line to walk when you're trying to tell the stories that appeal to you personally, but you have a certain identity. Um, it's how much of that identity do you want to bring into your work on a work by work basis? You know, it's, um, it's hard to, come out as and say like you know it's my brand is not entirely based on like you know my lived experience but my lived experience can inform what i do that's a tricky thing for people to kind of quantify i think in the industry yeah and i think that the industry has to be careful that we don't i'm just gonna like make yes. up a term like reverse stereotype right yeah. where it's like okay <laughs> you're black so you have to tell black stories yeah yeah uh, exactly. you know yes. right we need like to be in a way Lena Waith has said, when I asked her, what do you want to write next? And she said, I want to write the biopic about Mary Tyler Moore. And people were just like, what? And she was like, yeah, I love Mary Tyler Moore. I want to write that biopic. And they were like, but she's not black. It's, you know, like it's that. <laughs> Could but, you imagine yeah. telling someone, yeah, you can't tell a story because you're black. You, you yeah. should, we, we expect strictly <laughs> black stories from you. Right? Excuse right, me. Right. But sometimes it sort of feels like we're leaning that way. And, you know, we need to be, I think, very, very careful yeah. that, you know, yeah. we just, that yeah. we want writers, you know? I also feel that way about saying, telling, you know, primarily Caucasian people that they can't have a, you know, woman, pro like a black protagonist or mm -hmm. what have you. And I, not, not to say that everyone should, you know, feel the same way. It's, it's just like a personal taste of mine is I, I prefer a world where everyone can, tell very different stories um now as far as the authenticity goes it's it might be good to like consult with certain people or like do some research that kind of thing and and don't just like make stuff up you know um but uh i i prefer the the world where we can like you know clementine is a is a is a female protagonist who's you know colombian and i why did i do that well because i thought it was cool i wanted to see i want to watch a movie <laughs> called Clementine about this Colombian mother who's like dealing with all these things. So that's, yeah. that's, I hope that that's, you know, the reason that people continue to tell stories and, and, you know, the industry, they're, they're so, this, the spectrum is so feels, doesn't feel, either doesn't feel vast or feels too vast where it's, it's like, Oh, you know, good. This person's not white. So we're, we're in the clear. Um, you definitely want to, you know, stunt that way of thinking if we can help it. Right. Uh, yeah. I, I think that while I think it's great, of course, that any writer, any artist personalize their work, for me, it's really always about the passion. You know, like I don't really yeah. care where the passion comes from, just as long as it's there, you know, just, just because it's like, you know, somebody writes Jaws, Right, you know, it doesn't mean that Peter Benchley's mother was eaten by a shark. So can he just tell Or that you have story? to be a shark to write Josh. You know? Exactly, right. right. Can he just tell the story because he loves sharks and you know, he yeah. thinks it's really cool and like I'm really, really passionate about wanting to tell this story. To me, that's what's, that's what's most important is just that passion. And sure, mm -hmm. maybe it comes from something that's personal. Maybe it's just from something that you read and you just developed a passion, you know, like in the aftermath. Um, but uh, yeah. So I, I would just, I imagine now it's like, hey, you can't write a sci fi movie if you're not from the future. It's right. not <laughs> <laughs> the authenticity. Right? Or if you don't have a degree in quantum physics. I, so Black Girls Don't Swim <laughs> is about a Somali girl. Somebody asked me, 
so what, you know, who are you to tell this story? And I said, well, as far as I can tell, I'm the only person who's written this script. Oh! <laughs> script about this <laughs> thing. You know, so like, you, like granted, it'd be lovely to find a director who is, you know, a Somali American woman. Um, yeah. But either you want to see the movie get made or you don't. <laughs> you know, like you seriously. Or you don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, one of our priorities for Clementine was finding uh, Latinx female to direct. Um, but you know, after a certain time moment, you kind of have to open it up, and and whoever's the most passionate, I don't care what they look like. <laughs> um, right. that's that's who's probably that's most likely who's best for the project period you yes know? and I've had people meet me and be like we thought you would be Somali because the script is so, oh so specific Jeez. and detail and I go well that's what research does you know yeah. like <laughs> I, I didn't just like spur the moment side she's Somali you know like no like I do the research I read so many like message boards and blogs I spoke to friends who live in Minnesota like you do all that you can to embody that person right that character mm. come from where they're coming from and yet writers are curious about people i don't want to you know see my version of my life on screen forever i want to see other people's lives sure. i want to yeah. see clementine yeah, you know that curiosity that's yeah. a great point that curiosity is so important in the craft it's like you, that's what helps us write great dialogue or great characters exactly, is that yeah. constant curry that observation that curiosity of the people we grew up around and people who we watched on TV and or reality TV or like went to school with. That's like, I, I would hope, I would think that that's why a lot of people write screenplays and write like create characters out of thin air mm -hmm. is because of those things. Yeah. By the way, I love this. This is just, this is just so conversational. I feel like we're all just sort of like <laughs> in, like in a living room. Um, but now yeah. we're going to open it up. <laughs> questions from the group because we have people watching hello inside pitch members sorry that i've been ignoring you but uh, i'm sure that there are questions for david and lexi and and uh ramesh i'm not paying any attention to those questions so do you want to uh... Uh, yeah no uh yeah there are actually i also wanted to talk a little bit about your writing process because and i'm saying this rarely have i read i read two of dave's scripts and two of lexi's scripts in a like one bang 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 rarely have i read four scripts that i put down and go wow i loved all of them uh awesome. you know uh yeah. lexi's are just so different the, it's a wonderful story it has this very sort of preston sturgis quality to it mm. uh, which i loved wow. and then girls uh, black girls don't swim as a cynical as a cynical bastard that i am uh, you know, at the end of it, I'm reading it and I'm like, damn it, she's making me cry. Uh, <laughs> because it's so good. Don't you uh, hate that? <sighs> uh, uh, you know, and then on Dave's side, you have the, actually Clementine, which I read about three or four weeks ago. And then you have Cyber Gun and you have Bear Skull, which are all different. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, and so I was just wondering about your process when you sit down to write these, uh, because the storytelling is different too. I mean, Black Girls Don't Swim is very sort of, as I said, like bend it like Beckham, you know, meets Cool Runnings kind of, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and has that sort of rocky thing going for it. Uh, and but you captured the um, community so well. Thank you. Uh, you know, and the the little things they do, and there were so many wonderful, quiet moments in there. Uh, and then, so I just sort of that. want, and then it's a wonderful story. I'm reading this thing, and all I can see in my head is Sullivan's Travels. Uh, you know, I'm like, this is like that sort of vibe I got Which from it. Sturgis and not Capra. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sturgis also, I mean, a legend in his own right. My gosh, like right, exactly. Yeah. But it had that sort of vibe as I'm reading this, especially when uh, Capra is talking about making the movie and you know uh, all of that. So I was just sort of wondering about your writing process and how much. Do you like, do you sit down, do both of you sit down and outline? Do you sort of figure out what tone you want when you go into it? Um, just so that was essentially it, so. Um, Lexi, well, please. Sure, I'll start. Um, so for me, it's an ongoing evolution always in process, but yes, there is a process. Um, Black Girls Don't Swim was probably the first script I wrote that kind of, it cracked, you know, kind of me into my ability to where I was finally at the right level to kind of attract attention. And it was by finally understanding the purpose of the midpoint. 
Um, the midpoint of that particular movie is where, so my main character's name is Halima, and Halima uh, joins the school swim team secretly. Her parents, her mother doesn't know. Her mother is very against it because Halima's father was a, a swimmer and he drowned. And so she's very against, you know, her kids swimming for many reasons. Uh, that's the main one. Mm. So Halima joins the swim team. And my initial impression or my initial thought was I'm going to let, you know, Halima's mom find out that she's swimming as like the act two to act three break. And so as I was thinking about it and I was writing, I was like, you know, it's a long time to make this tension stretch. You know, what if that's the midpoint? What if the midpoint is her mom finds out and then we have the whole rest of the movie to find out, well, well then what? And so structuring it in that way really broke it open for me. And the structure of that script, I think, is what really kind of makes it because um, this whole first half is this girl trying to join the swim team. And the second half is this girl trying to, again, bridge the divide between who she wants to be and who her community wants to be and how she transforms everyone in doing what she wants to do. So I took that process and I applied everything since. And with It's a Wonderful Story, the process becomes, I have to know what the midpoint and the ending are. And from there, I can always play with and determine what the beginning is. Um, I also then start to kind of go, you know, in some, I, I go from top down, basically. So what's my three act structure? And then what are the sequences within each act? And then within each act, what are the scenes? And my scenes always have to have a value change in them. Um, there's like four basic emotions, happy, sad, glad, and like it's mad, sad, glad, and scared. That's what they are. Mm -hmm. And so every scene of mine will switch from one to the other. It's, it's from sad to mad or it's from mad to glad. And they can Robert repeat. McKee writes about this. Exactly, he does book. too, yes. Yes. Yeah. yes, and so I do that value change um, as well. And, uh, and from there, I, I play. So I have an outline. If things don't work, I go right back to basic outline. I don't try to kind of fix execution. I go right back to structure, because structure is everything. Um, and the character for me comes out of the structure. So it's... I'm, I'm a structure first person, character second, which is, I think, generally not how people do it. That's how I do it. Um, and my characters, I focus on, you know, who are they? Like, not even who are they. What do they want? Why don't they have it? Sometimes <laughs> yeah. if they don't get it. You know, your basic stakes questions that you have to be able to, like, your reader has to be able to understand and, and answer those questions on every single page. And if they can't, you haven't done your job. So that's what it boils down to for me. Great answer. Love that. <clears throat> yeah, my my process is um, a little sloppier. So I, what typically happens is that I I'm I'm a very visual person, and so I get inspired by like random like I'll have random images in my head that that elicits a kind of a kind of mood or a tone or a color, very much like in a, like in a Blade Runner sense. I think that's I think I, that may be where I get that from. Uh, where it's like it's a very brooding dystopian what have you um, and then from there like a really cool concept might hit me and I'll be like oh that's badass and if I don't have a story yet though I'll just like I'll just kind of stew on it intermittently for days weeks sometimes months and on rare occasions years mm -hmm. um, and then once I in you know during the time I've been writing other stuff that I thought about previously and and you know or I'm busy and I'm doing whatever and then when so I kind of I kind of just let things kind of come to me and and then when it, when it has all the components for when the, when the 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 story is kind of is like mostly there and I feel ready I I I kid you not I just kind of jump in and start writing I I am not and this isn't necessarily I'm not a, I'm not an anti outliner by any means I can do it my reps want me to do it whatever and then so I. <laughs> Paid steps, I, David. Paid steps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when, when they are paid, <laughs> I will take those steps. Oh. <laughs> so, with that said, I, um, you know, I, I jump straight in. I feel like I have, I get the most enjoyment out of under, like, seeing where it goes, and and it kind of, it almost has to answer my questions for me. I'm not the one answering the questions. <laughs> the story and the characters are kind of answering those questions for me. Um, and typically as far as like, I love the point that Alexandra brought up of like, it, I, I feel like it's really good practice to know something that's going to happen. So whether it's your midpoint, your ending, and for me, it has to be the beginning. I can't start the script without knowing 
having a very, very clear vision of the first 10 to 15 pages. And if I ever do outline, it's just for that sequence, just for like, you know, half or most of the first act, I will outline that because I need to know, like down to the minute detail, how that's going to play out. And then from there, that, that kind of informs the rest of the structure. And I, I kind of figure it out from there. Ironically, Clementine is somewhat of an exception where I, and this is, this is going to sound really absurd. I, pr- I don't do this all the time, trust me. But basically, I, was, I got really inspired. The, idea, the, the whole idea came to me. I wanted to see a movie about a woman getting out of a, a failed heist on the run for 90 minutes, real time. I wanted to see that movie yesterday. So I was so I was so inspired that I that night I had you know the same night that I came up with the idea I had about twenty five pages written I had the whole first act was was out and I had a draft by the end of the and by the end of the week I had a draft wow um, and then I sat but the problem is I sat on that draft for about six months <laughs> before I showed it to anyone and then I got notes and I implemented some some ideas and then that's literally the version of Clementine that's, that's gone out is, is that second draft. Um, so all in all, it was, it was like a couple weeks or what have you. And typically I, I do, I am a pretty fast writer, but not necessarily out of like, again, not really a flex, just how I'm wired. I, I just like, I get really into it and I'm just like, I'm obsessed and sometimes I'll get like anxiety if I'm not writing that story, <laughs> like immediately getting it on the page. Um, and you know, I've been writing for so many years that I do, there is a level of confidence in knowing that chances are what I'm putting out there is, is at least readable. You know, my reps aren't going to hate me for it and they haven't yet. So, uh, clearly it works, but, uh, but yeah, so it's, it's a lot of like, it's all up here. Everything is up here. All the ideas are up here. If it sticks, it's probably, it was probably meant to stick. Uh, if it's, if it's fallen by the wayside, it probably wasn't that great. So and typically I, 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 by the time I write, I start writing. Those are not first ideas. They're like the fourth, fifth, or sixth I- version of that idea. Um, I don't usually put a lot of first ideas on the on the page. There's a lot of thinking that goes into it. So, uh, and then I kind of I know how the end. I know the ending. Usually, I know my ending after I've already started writing. So, and I it, it kind of comes to me after that. The ending of Baskal kind of I was like, whoa, that is something I didn't expect. <laughs> it, was just, it was really good, uh, you know, and it's a heck of a story because as I'm reading, it's like such a simple but cool concept. Uh, I'm curious, Thank what's you. Bear Skull about? Uh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, Bear Skull is a it's a horror thriller. It's mostly contained. It's about these uh, animal rights activists. They're like a guerrilla group of animal rights activists who are trying to protect this these like bear cubs that are being um, poached by this like cult. And when they get there, they get kind of ambushed and they're literally stuck in this cabin and there's a giant grizzly bear in the cabin with them and they're surrounded by the cult <laughs> in that cabin. And that and we're not done. That cult is summoning this mythical beast to come devour the bear and them. So that's what Bear Skull's about. Wow. Yeah, I it's, think, okay. it's insane. I mean, that sounds to me like we should sell it to Universal and make it part of the Cocaine Bear franchise. <laughs> yeah, who knows, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. If it's a big hit, anything can happen. Hey, I you know one of my generals from Bear Skull because I don't know how it, I got. I, I'll keep this story very short, but I, I'm very fortunate that there's an exec at a studio that he loves Clementine, but he also loves Bear Skull, and he's actually the reason that um, Verve got you know that I ended up signing with Verve that they got the script so quickly because he sent them to people at Verve. Um, and I think, I guess one of my agents read Bear Skull and I, I never knew that. And so when I had a, a meeting because of Bear Skull, I was like, what, what, <laughs> you guys are sending that out. So, um, but yeah, that's a fun little short story about Bear Skull. I mean, just the sound of it, like what a, that's a voice right there. Like that's something that could only have come from your brain. That's incredible. Probably honestly, wow. based on the movies I, on the movies <laughs> I love to watch. So you're like, yeah. damn, I'm so not creative. <laughs> yeah. sort of the, the story just keeps escalating that thing. I'm yeah, just, yeah, I'm like, 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 how much <laughs> worse can it get? Oh yeah, it gets worse. Uh, it just keeps getting worse. Right, for these guys. And I, what, in your process when you're writing, do you, you, how many drafts do you usually go through? And then do you send out your drafts? Do you have, have a bunch of like beta readers who read it and give you feedback? Or how, what's your process there? Yeah, I, um, 
I usually feel comfortable with something after about the third or fourth draft, but again, that's just like it took me years to get to that point. I mean, it used to be I would need twelve drafts. <laughs> so, but yeah, after the first, I comb through it. I try to make everything logical and make sure it's cohesive. And I have a few friends, that, really good friends of mine, that I send it to. And then I want to have the next draft, and I try to expand and send it more to like acquaintances and get feedback from there. Uh, between the second and third draft, I start looking at like maybe coverages or something like that to to get that extra objective uh, feedback. So uh, yeah, that's kind of how the the process is. I feel like there's another part of your question. I forgot what part it was, but that's that's how I that's how I get feedback. Well, it's a little different now because I have you know my team. I have my manager. I go. So what I do is I my first draft I send to that select group of friends. And I might send it to my manager, or I might wait until the second draft to send it to him. Um, on my end, I, I only send things to my manager at this point. Um, I've never had my friends read my work because I just, it, it's too close. I feel like if they know me, it's too close to the, the subject matter. I'd always have someone mm. I don't know read my work, preferably. Um, but now with my manager, we've gotten to the point where as I'm writing, I can hear her voice in my head and I can hear like, oh, this is not, this is not clear. And how about a little like description line here? I can hear her saying it. So by the time I get to what I consider a draft like 1.5, it's ready for her to see it. Um, and this is, of course, after like we do we do a ton of work before even getting to like pages. So like I'll pitch her a concept and if she likes the concept, then cool, we'll develop it further. And then we do beats. I'll do a beat sheet. And she'll like, kind of look at the beat sheet. And she's so good at determining, like, this is a double beat here. And we're missing a beat here. And so we'll kind of build out that way. And then by then, when I go to pages, it's able to do a full draft, which is usually pretty, pretty succinct. Every now and then, like with It's a Wonderful Story, we have a problem. And it took us a year to figure it out. And I ended up, I have a two-year-old son, and I was watching Paddington 2 with him. And it was like a eureka moment because it was like, oh, I'm trying to give both of my main characters, you know, full arcs and transformations. And it's not working because it's ending up double beats. So one of them needs to be Paddington, who does not change and who changed everyone around him. <laughs> the other one gets to have the full arc. And that draft is the one that went to the agents and went out to town. I love that. <laughs> I, and I should mention that I, I do have now kind of that build up to like the draft. I, I do kind of like run the idea by, um, and what's cool is I'm, I'm very, for, I don't know if this is the same case with, with you, um, Lexi, where I, I do, you know, especially on the team with like a pilot, you know, my agent is also kind of involved with the development of that, of that concept. Mm -hmm. um, and then I go into like a one pager or, which is not necessarily a treatment, uh, but it's like, but it kind of is, I, it's hard to, it's kind of hard to explain actually. And then from that, you know, I do a couple of, I do a couple of drafts with that one pager. And then when everyone's like, oh, okay, cool. Let's go into an outline. And then I go into the outline and then I do a, a two or three drafts with that outline. And then at a, you know, at a certain point, I'm like, okay, guys, are we, are we good? You know? And then, <laughs> and then I, I, because I, I just love the actual physical act of writing so much. Like it's, it's almost a problem. I try to get to the draft as soon as I can, but my man, thank God my reps are there to be like, do you calm down? <laughs> um, but then after like a few drafts of both the one pager and then the outline, then I get into uh, a draft. My agent team really only comes in at the very end. And we ask them when Kate and I are pretty sure that we have a really solid draft, we'll go to them and we'll ask for their notes and they'll come back with usually really easily executable, not structure based notes. And we'll do mm. that and then we'll take it out. But I find it really challenging. So I don't even start, I don't even pitch up concepts to Kate until I have a working log line. The log line for me is my canary in the coal mine, my litmus test. If I don't have a working log line that describes to you and gives you an idea of what the movie will be, I don't have the concept yet. So that's my start. And for me, like the shorter the amount of writing, the harder it is to do. Like, a one pager is so hard to <laughs> accomplish. Really As opposed so and the, the <laughs> tech is like hell on earth. Like hell on earth trying to disseminate like a story or a, a, a pilot a one season into a pitch deck. Awful. Script out of pages, control. So much easier, right? Like, so much easier. Much oh easier. Oh my gosh. Uh, we have a question from James J. Says something that figures in screenplays is irony. How purposeful are you in pursuing that? And when do you establish the theme of your script? Mm. Oh wow! So that's kind of two questions. Um, <laughs> when do you, if you, if if irony is a part of the 
concept development process and also when do you figure out your theme? I feel like that's those are the two questions, maybe? Yes. Do you want to go first? Um, so I, I don't think about irony at all in that sense. <laughs> um, to be perfectly honest with you, I just don't. Uh, as far as theme, theme is one of those things that everyone seems to have a different definition of. And it's really tricky to nail down. And I prefer um, Robert McKee's kind of version of it, which is like every every story, your A, your B, and your C story, and your in your you know feature script is trying to prove a point, trying to prove a truth. And they either prove it the positive or they prove it the negative. Whatever that central idea is is my theme. So that's the way that I approach it. Yeah, I'm kind of the same about irony. I think irony just kind of happens by accident for me. Um, and I don't necessarily, I know that it can be good for, I think comedy log lines sometimes. It could be fun Ooh. to have some irony in there. Um, but I never, I, it's never weighed, you know, as far as like, oh, do I have that? If I don't, then I need to go back to the drawing board. It's, it's never yeah. one of those things. If we're talking um, about irony, like, oh, it's ironic that, you know, Frank Capra needs to learn this lesson that he's trying to tell, you know, in this movie, It's a Wonderful Life. That is a function of character development, right? Your character yes. has, your character doesn't know what they need to be whole. And they discover it throughout the course of the story, right? So they can't start mm. out being like a whole, healthy, functioning human being. They have a core no. wound, they have something they're trying to work through in kind of your classic three-act structure. So in that sense, yes, that, if that's the irony we're talking about, then yes. And that is a function of, again, like where your, your character starts and where they end up. So again, it's what do they want? Why do they want it? What will happen if they don't get it? And what will happen if they don't get it is always some version of death. It's either physical death or it's mm. like a psychological, like, you know, death. Like that's, that's always the stakes. It's always life or death stakes for these folks or else they don't go to the lengths they go to to achieve their goal. And that's, I think, the real narrative strength you have to have from day one, page one, act one. Yeah, to kind of bounce off of what you said, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's probably, as far as like the story goes, it's probably good if the irony is a byproduct of you know the actions of your characters or the the world that you've created you know I don't, I wouldn't prioritize irony because that's that's one of those things where it's like you know yes irony might get someone to read irony in your logline might get someone to read your script but is it going to sustain your script it it's not it's not necessarily indicative of of quality it's just kind of slick it's just a tool and it's a very first act you know, centric thing as well. You still have to tell your second act where there's the real execution and then your third act, that kind of thing. And as far as uh, theme goes, I usually don't, I usually either figure out theme before I start writing and not necessarily on purpose, or I realize it like to the, like near the end or after I've written the script, I go, oh, I realize now this is what this is actually about. So, um, you know, that's kind of my, my approach to theme is again, I don't, I don't prioritize some of those peripheral, you know, those nebulous things. Um, entertainment is probably priority number one for me and uh, world feeling and character. All the, those things are, are my priorities. That's why you're going to make it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have one final thing that I will say. I think that the best person that I think working these days who, who coalesces entertainment and theme and all those things is Ryan Coogler, who I actually think mm. is an almost better writer than a director. And if you go back and you rewatch Creed, the first Creed, there's that point at like, it's, it's the act two to act three break, I think, where um, Adonis finally says, you know, what, it's like, why are you doing this? And he says, to prove I'm not a mistake. And that's the mm -hmm. whole theme of the movie. And he says it right there in one line and it's motivated in that moment. But of course, as you think back on the, everything that came before, it makes sense. Coogler is one to study when it comes to theme. Same thing with Fruitvale Station. He does an incredible job there. Same yeah. thing with both Wakanda movies. The man really does theme extremely well. Someone here has a, a question. As storytellers, how do you feel and deal with description and any tips on writing uh, dialogue and points of view? Hmm. Go ahead, Dave. So uh, description for me is 
I just kind of come back to entertainment. I literally, I, I truly, as primitive as this may sound, I, I literally, I just want to enter- entertain people. I have a really bad attention span when it comes to reading. So I, my first, I'm my first audience member. If, and if I can actually get through the script, there's, there's hope with it. So um, as far as like description goes, I think word economy is great, but not, you don't want to be too succinct where, as you don't want to ask too much from your reader, I think it's just really good to explain in the best words possible what's happening. Just be, just be very direct about what's happening, and you'll be surprised how just like very smooth and lean the writing will be if you're just if you're just explaining what's happening. I do like to kind of mix it up with like, you know, if I if there are if there's if I'm trying to explain an action that you know a normal person a normal writer would use five words to explain but you can you can find two really cool words to explain it or two or three um i'm more of, i'm more in that camp but that's just like a personal thing for me i just try to i just try to be as entertaining as possible and i i usually want every line of description to feel like their own story in a way um and as far as dialogue that's just like with experience honestly i in my opinion i think um i think you know your behavior has something to do with it but also just like what we talked about before where you're just being very observational about what's around you, the kind of people that you meet, you know, in the same way that, you know, um, Alexandra was inspired to write the story about the Swahili simmer, swimmers. She might be, maybe she met some people in her life who were Swahili who spoke a certain type of way. And that can inform how, you know, the dialogue of those of characters that are kind of akin to that person. So I think that's, a, that's a huge life experience kind of thing. And um, you know you can spice it up with your 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 own thing as well, but it's just uh, you got to have an ear for it. I feel like uh, I agree. Having an ear for it is is crucial, and you can develop it. Um, so mm-hmm. for description, for me, likewise, entertainment is key. These scripts have to be. You want to read down the page, not across the page. So everything that I write, the description is there for a reason. So the difference between like describing a room and going into the detail of like the curtains are, you know, faded. Well, does the curtains being faded affect the story or tell me something about the character, like outright? If it doesn't, then I don't include it. But if I say things like, this is a, you know, it's a roach infested hotel with, you know, two packed bags in the corner, that tells you that this is a place someone's just arrived to, somebody with no money, somebody who is not living here long-term. So that tells you something about the character. Um, and with regards to descriptions of character themselves, a lot of folks like to give a physical description, like this person is tall and blonde and wears, you know, Ed Hardy. I prefer to describe their character. So for example, the woman who created the Barbie doll, I describe her simply as a 1950s beauty with a 1980s mind and leave Mm -hmm. it at that. It tells you who she is. She's ahead of her time, but still a product of her time. There's that kind of duality in her. Um, And the dialogue for me is always based on what's what are we trying to accomplish in the scene so like a scene's always a conflict who's trying to accomplish what and what is the dynamic of the characters so if you have somebody like you've got a child arguing with the parent the parent you know might try to explain with like long-winded explanations you know how parents can be well in my experience we do blah 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 and the kid wants to get their, their mind across and see what they want to say mom stop mom we, i'm going to do it this way okay like just staccato beats versus mom's long language when I was your age, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. That's the way I approach it. You know, it's like, what's this person's personal context and how do they speak to you? Older folks will have different idioms than younger folks. You know, you think about the way that, you know, the TikTok generation talks versus Gen Z and versus the millennials. Like we all have different points of reference and it comes across in how you speak. I also what? would love to, trampoline off as opposed to bounce off the idea that's, that's, that's an example of how to say things more interesting uh, the character descriptions I, I you know I definitely recommend trying to introduce characters in action as much as possible uh, I think that action will inform the mm-hmm. the reader about what kind of person they are what kind of situation they're in uh, you know so let's say this is a horrible example but for instance that person who's in that roach infested you know hotel room or what have you is killing all the roaches, you know, they're just like on a mission to mm-hmm. exterminate all the roaches in that hotel room. Well, that tells you that they're not comfortable. They're not, they're not in, they're not in a comfort, they're not in their comfort zone. They're not, this is not how they roll. Typically they're out of their element, that kind of thing. 
Yeah, you know, yeah. I would actually, if I could just, just fine tune that and say that introduce them in conflict, mm. you know, so, um, which is really the same thing as what you're saying. Um, but, you know, some people would think, oh, well, if a character is running down the street, you know, he's like jogging for exercise, that's action. But that's not necessarily conflict. If he's being chased by somebody, then it becomes conflict. If he's trying to kill cockroaches in a room, that's conflict. Um, I always say try to introduce your character in conflict. In their, you know, in their world, this doesn't mean that they have to be dismantling a bomb, you know, but it's just, it's just some sort of conflict. It just makes reading so much more interesting because people who read scripts, that's what we thrive on. You know, we're thriving for conflict. Because what I enjoyed about what I enjoyed about both your scripts, all your scripts, is that the, your writing styles are different, but they both. I just wanted to turn the page to see what happened next. You know, with with Clementine, we just sort of you don't waste any time in Clementine. I mean, that thing starts with that car scene and goes straight into the heist, and then gunshots, and you know she's on her way. And you have it's a wonderful life, it's a wonderful story, which is different. But both stories, I'm like, I really want to know what happens next, <laughs> uh, you know. But uh, someone here asked a question about now that you're both repped and you sort of, you know, you, you're writing biopics, and Alexi, you're writing biopics and dramas, and you're writing action. Do your managers want you to uh, advising you to? Uh, what are they advising you to pursue right now? And do they sort of, you know, do they want you to do more TV, more feature? And are they sort of, someone else asked, do they want you to sort of stick to one genre? Do they want you to brand yourself? Right, that's, yes. Mm. Mm. Alexandra, please. Um, my team leaves it largely up to me. Um, I do, we do have conversations about what to write next, and we've just recently, at the top of this year, decided, okay, we have a lot of samples of, of you know, biopics and dramas of the contemporary and uh, period. One of the reasons I wrote It's a Wonderful Story was because thus far I had been known for writing female characters, and I wanted to prove I could write male characters too. So I wrote a two-hander for male characters. And my new project that I'm working on right now is more of a, kind of a quirky romance, actually, um, more in the vein of like Palm Springs, uh, which is a different tone. It's a different kind of story. And it is to kind of branch out a little bit. Um, again, I think the key to branding is to make your brand flexible enough for you to do what you want to do. So I know a lot of folks say their brand is like, well, I write, you know, I write thrillers and I write horror. And, like, and that's what they call their brand. But like, I think if you can ground your brand more specifically in the types of characters you want to play with, if you can even kind of disseminate it into like a, a type, that opens up your avenues then to other genres because you might actually find that you want to write, you know, like a war picture at some point, right? And you can still play with those elements. It's just not the genres that you traditionally like to play with. So I keep my brand as loose as possible. Uh, I just, the only things I don't do are, um, I don't do horror and I don't do, uh, I, I don't really do thrillers. Those are the two things that are kind of no's for me. Everything else is open game. So that's how I keep it loose. Love that. I, I'm kind of in the very similar boat. And I and also, honestly, ever since I've been signed, I haven't heard any kind of inklings about, like, you have to stick to a certain thing. I think it's, um, honestly, it might even just be a false narrative, if I'm going to be completely honest with you. So, But, like, you know, for as far as, like, you know, specifically in my relationship with my reps it's it's really just like i think they there, there might be a, there might be an element of trust there they they know that i'm a genre person um so and you know they're they're into those genres and um you know sci-fi i i do do the thriller stuff and the action and sci-fi and horror comedy a little bit as well um you know and i think the the industry changes the trends are so no one has any idea what's going to happen in six months in this industry ever. They never know what's gonna happen. So it makes no sense to try and write for something that you're not, you don't know is going to happen. It only makes sense to write for yourself. And a, from my, from my you know, granted brief experience, reps know that and they, they're signing you usually because they love what you bring to the table because of what you do that's specific to you. Um, so any log line I've sent, I've sent all kinds of 
different genre log lines to my team, and I no one has, is a, has ever even implied that I should try and narrow down what I do. <laughs> you know, so um, I think it's important for writers not to worry about that too much and, and just focus on writing what they want to write. Yeah, I to bounce off what you were saying, I think in this particular iteration of the industry too, the the lines between everything are just so blurry. Like it used to be you're a yeah. feature writer, you're a TV writer, and now everyone does both. Like I know yes. I certainly do. I do right? as well. That's, that's just the way it is right now. So I have two uh, shows that are set up, and they couldn't be more different. One of them I wrote a number of years ago, and the, my manager's prompt to me was, write us a world we've never seen before. So I wrote a show about the underground, unregulated world of hair brokers, women <laughs> who buy and sell human hair for wigs and weaves and extensions. And it's flipping amazing. It's called Weave No Tits. Um, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, I, and it just, I was like, oh, you know what? A better title would be, would be, be pressed. Pressed would be a good title for that, too. Um, but then, uh, <laughs> yeah. And then completely opposite. I wrote a pilot a year ago um, based on an idea that I had and it's a Western about cryptocurrency. Mm. Contemporary, it's Yellowstone, but about cryptocurrency. And so, again, couldn't be more different from everything else I've done. But again, it shows my voice. It shows kind of my perspective of things, which is finding two things that are completely opposite and kind of find their, their similarity and kind of make it come together. You have to be flexible and uh, find a way to brand, your, brand yourself to work within that flexibility. One other really important thing is that so many production companies are this term again, genre agnostic, where they a lot of them don't have that focus on one singular thing. Many of them are looking for multiple things. I think the more that you can, the more that you practice in different genres, the more of your higher your odds of overlapping with those genres and being, you know, being someone that they can look at and go, oh yeah, okay, yeah, this person. Mm -hmm says that they, that they dabble a little bit in sci-fi or, or westerns or what have you if you're too strict about your brand and your genre you 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 might you know lose those opportunities yeah agreed wow so we are closing in on two hours we have kept you two <laughs> I know. far longer than we had promised <laughs> um but it really has been a great conversation um yeah. but is there anything that i didn't ask uh, of anything that I do well, I always have a couple of questions. Oh, so. I know. <laughs> I'm here so as long as you need me. Yeah, as long this, as you know. <laughs> this is for the group, though. It's like so you've, I, both, yeah. you've both taken meetings with um, execs and uh, production companies. What are some of the sort of you know tips, do's and don'ts when you approach a general or even a pitch to go pitch? Mm. Well, Mr. Awesome. 100 meetings here, take that. <laughs> I, I knew it was coming. Uh, so <laughs> you asked for it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, sorry, past Dave. But uh, yeah, so I think for generals, because there's two totally different things, generals and, and you know pitch meetings, but basically for generals, it's just really good to be yourself. I can't stress that enough. Um, and you know just be nice everyone i've met has been super nice and you know it's it's a good idea to have like a really quick kind of the same way that you know um alexandra and i talked about our our past a little bit that was like a what like a, maybe like a five minute bio at most for each of us it's good to kind of have that on deck because inevitably they're going to ask you to talk about yourself and uh and then they'll also be ready to talk about what your goals are and, and what genres you love to write in and uh, you don't really need like elevator pitches, but it's good to have like two sentence, like, you know, not a log line, but just like a description of things you're working on or things you want to start working on or things you, you know, wish you were working on. Uh, but like, you don't necessarily need to like overthink any of that. Usually from my experience, someone is going to ask you those questions. So, you know, only have it ready for those times. Otherwise just like, it's like a date, honestly. It's just like a friend date. For pitches, that's a totally different thing. Um, conviction, vision and conviction are probably the two biggest things you need in your pitch. You need to be willing to drive yourself into a wall uh, and die on all kinds of hills <laughs> for your idea. No one wants, you know, no one wants you to half-ass your confidence in what you're pitching. And um, it's okay in, in the in the time of Zoom. It's okay not to try and memorize your stuff and recite it word for word. It's okay to have a cheat sheet and read off of that cheat sheet. 
so those are probably the three biggest things I would I would say about pitching. Just be like you have to be willing to embarrass yourself when you're pitching. Mm. If you're not doing that, you're not doing it right. In my from my experience, um, yeah, those that's what I have to say about those. Good answer. I have nothing to add except um, with regards to pitching. I know that my weak point with pitching is I'm when I'm pitching and it's like no one else is talking as well. There's not a conversation. I'm uncomfortable with the sound of my own voice. So <laughs> yeah. to get comfortable with my own voice, I pitch every day. I pitch in the car on the way home from daycare drop-off. I pitch what I'm working on. I pitch movies that I've seen. I pitch whatever I can think of to get comfortable with my own voice. And you'd be amazed how five minutes of doing that every day will suddenly transform into pitching randomly in a meeting and someone's like, well, could you do that again? Like for my boss, at, like tomorrow. And suddenly you can. That's awesome. I, that's a great note. I might actually take that. <laughs> I might, might sample some of that. I also do get to practice. If you have reps, I practice, practice with your reps as much as you can. I do that as well. Um, they're going to be very, especially your agents are going to be very blunt with you. And, uh, but you know, recently they were really excited about the last thing that I, that I practiced with. So, uh, don't be afraid to practice. It's going to, it's going to be harder than the actual pitch. Ideally <laughs> you want, you want, you want the real thing to be the easy part. Um, at least for me, that's, that's how I operate. Mm. Uh, what is, I jotted this down. What is one thing you, you believe writers, aspiring writers, emerging writers need to know, uh, or that you wish you had known now that you, where you are at? Great question. Um, <laughs> I, for me, it's 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 anything. It's the business related stuff. Um, everyone tends to focus on the craft, and the craft is you know elusive, and everyone's version is different. I think more writers need to understand the business end of things, and the simplest way to do that is to read the trades every day. Um, you'll hear this from me a lot. I'm a big believer in five minutes every day as opposed to like, you know, one hour once a week. So read the trades, read deadline. It's the easiest, the river flow of information. And you very quickly begin to understand how things work, which then gives you lasting power when you deal with the setbacks of the writing career, because there will always inevitably be setbacks. Um, and it's very easy to kind of close in on yourself and say, oh, it's all about me. It's all, it's my problem. If you have greater context of the industry and how it works, suddenly you see that it's not all entirely about you and you have a better idea of how to position yourself going forward. I, I think that's the perfect answer, honestly. <laughs> like I, yeah. I, yeah, it's just, it's so important to, it's perspective is so important. You know, it's very, you know, I, I've been passed on like almost all of my pitches and mm -hmm. it's so easy, easy, like Alexander said, to like lock yourself in this cave of doubt um, but luckily my team is so great at telling me just FYI, everyone's getting passed on every day. We're not the only one we're telling this to like, there are people who are established writers who have made billions of dollars for everyone and they still get passed. So, um, that's something that like, you know, I think a lot of people, especially with like, with like, you know, contest disappointments for those aspiring writers who are probably like running the, that gamut, um, just know that you're not the only one it's it's so hard to to remember that but like please and just keep and just like keep persisting like i i always did because that's just how i'm wired but i do know that some writers may need to hear that just keep writing please uh no matter if you think you suck keep writing if you think you're the shit keep writing uh keep keep going 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 because it might be that next script that really does it for you uh, and I'll I'll say the last thing on my part, which is this is something that writers never say. This is I have the opposite opinion I think of everyone I've ever met who's a writer, which is that writing is not your identity. Writing is what you do. It is not who you are, and that distinction is crucial. It is everything, because when you get rejected for any number of reasons, if writing is your identity, then you take it to heart like you would never believe, and it will make you stop writing way sooner than you should. So writing is what you do. Your identity is something else. You keep them separate as much as you possibly can. Mm. You love to write. That's cool. But it's not who you are. Build your identity around things that are unassailable, around your family, your friends, your other hobbies, whatever else you love, not around the writing. And that's how you get the resilience to keep going. It's a good lesson Beautiful. in mental health in this yes. business, that's for sure. My mom's a psychiatrist. I, I have a little bit of an answer. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Wise that's words. Awesome. Um, yeah. 
Um, so what is next for both of you? What are you doing? What's on the horizons? What can you share with us? Um, let's see. I just took a show out a couple weeks ago. Um, I have another one that we're hoping to take out. God knows when. At this point in time of this interview, the industry is in absolute chaos. So who the heck knows <laughs> when we can take this other show out. Um, and I'm writing a new feature. And after that, I'm planning to uh, apply to the TV writing fellowships and kind of just keep going and see, you know, it's, it's a page at a time, script at a time. You can't look further ahead than that, as far as I know. So next project. Yeah. Wow. If you guys would give me one second, my phone is going to die soon. So I'm just uh -oh, going to uh -oh. take a really awkward few seconds to charge it, to plug it in. Give me one second. This is what happens when we keep people. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Plus out. This, is, this, is, this is a great conversation, though. It is a great conversation. It, it, it is. A, uh, how many, uh, since Lexi's here, how, many, how much do you write a day? Do you write every day? Oh. Um, I, yes, I try to write every day. I probably, I write about four hours every day. That's as much as I can sustain mentally. You said you have children. I do. I have a son, a two-year-old yeah. son. Okay. Are you in Los Angeles? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so you got a lot of stuff to do. I have a lot of stuff to do, yeah. yeah. And my husband runs a business. I help him with a lot of it. I do a lot of writing for the business. Um, I'm privileged in the sense that I don't have to go to a nine to five these days anymore. Like I did when I was first coming up. Um, but the burnout is, is real. Burnout is very much a factor. Um, and when I was writing, it's a wonderful story. My husband was on the road touring and my son wasn't sleeping. So like I would be up in the middle of the night, you know, like tending to my kid and then going back and working on pages. Right. And I had an OWA, same thing. The contract is due. You got to get it done, and you have to work it around your. Yeah, you're not making. Your you're not making any excuses. You no. You write every day. Dave, yes. You said that you have, and we'll get back to that other question. But you said that um, you still have a day job. So yeah. how do you find time to write? I am just man. It's I don't have the best answer for this i'm just so wired to do it i i will i will make time no matter what so you know i sometimes i take my laptop to, to my to my day job i've had all my meetings there too like well most of my meetings i've taken uh at the day job luckily i'm in a position where i can do that you know um it's very my job is extremely chill and i'm by myself in the in the in the in my in my like one very secluded office um, I write like anytime it's convenient, I'm, I'm writing, um, that said, I don't necessarily write every day though. So I, I just write whenever I feel like it. Cause I know I'm, I know I'm going to do it. So <laughs> you wrote like, a script in a week. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. yeah. So, I took, and you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm pretty sure I didn't write every day that week. I wrote most of it. Like it was really like maybe four days out of that week wow. that I, or maybe wow. five, uh, probably five. Um, that I, that I wrote it. So it's like, you know, sometimes I just like, I'm very, I'm very streaky, you know? Um, I will like, for instance, with bear skull, I think I wrote 40 pages of that script in one day. I was just so inspired. And this is kind of the, this is also a byproduct of like not outlining is that like, you know, I figured I might take one or two days to figure out what's next. But then once I have it sorted out, it's like, then it's go time. I can write all day. Um, you know, I can you know write for eight hours or <laughs> like nine hours, I'm, or, or I'm. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm curious. What do you do when you have writer's block? I just stop. I just like I just block? I will just let it. I'll just let it come to me, whatever it is. Over time, I'll just like I will happily just like oh well, and then in like a few days time it'll come back. Um, it's pretty rare that I force myself through it. I'm mm -hmm. more of in the camp of like take the pressure off and don't stress yourself out and um, mm -hmm. sit back. And I just, uh, I'm in a position where I can kind of trust that the ideas will come to me to kind of solve that puzzle. So that's what I, I, I don't, I'm pretty sure I get writer's block. I can't think of an example, but I, but I know I have, and I know that that's what I do when I, when I have that issue. I think what's, the, the, the takeaway from this is that um, regardless of how you do it, whether it's every day or whether it's four days, uh, you have to do it. I mean, you yeah. know, that's like, you just, you just, you have to figure it out. 
and you have to do mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And you and you two are cl like clearly workers. You know, you you you're <laughs> like you're you're got, you're cranking stuff out. David, um, what's on your horizon? Oh yeah, so I um just I just finished a pilot. An early draft. I'm going to jump into the next draft of it. It's like a sci-fi. It's like if the White Lotus had like a sci-fi twist to it, essentially. Um, and <laughs> just, I just got done with like a big run of pitches and I'm so relieved to be kind of done, like, done with them. Uh, I am working on, and you know, I'm in, I'm in the middle of, I'm in very, very preliminary discussions on, with an, on an OWA with a producer and, and luckily this one does not involve a pitch, which is incredible. And it's just uh, to put together a one page area for him. And we're having like a series of discussions, which is like how I feel like things should be happening most of the time where we just like, we just meet up and we just talk and see what, what, you know, he's kind of sorts out what he wants and doesn't want, as opposed to people figuring that out when you're in the middle of your pitch, you know, <laughs> people realize like when you're in the middle of talking, they go, Oh, we don't want that. Never mind. Um, this is a very different case where we're kind of sussing those things out beforehand. So uh, I'm just, I'm developing that one pager, uh, putting something together for a video game company. Um, you know, I went through their catalog and um, another exec wants to see a one pager for an original like pilot idea. So it's, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty chill. Eventually I'll get around to this feature. I, that myself and my team are super excited about and some people, you know, producers I've spoken to are very excited about and it's a supernatural horror. It's like a fun, very fun supernatural horror about a uh, cursed arcade machine <laughs> that stalks you. So it's like, it's stranger things meets it follows and it's a feature. So I cannot wait to get started on that and, and hopefully have that circulating at some point soon. Great. Where can our members follow you? We know you're on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I don't know. Is it a, what do you call it? It's like your Twitter handle or something. What, what, what yeah, I think, I think so. so. Mine is, uh, it's Lex Woj Tran, which is L E X W O J T R A N. So that's me. I'm only ever on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, and mine is at storyteller Dave, all one word. <laughs> storyteller Great. Dave. All right, so when we're done here, go and follow them. Uh, I cannot thank you two enough. I do have one more question. Whoa, no! <laughs> <laughs> no. What a twist. Is what a twist. Let this is my people go. It says both of, you got your, both of you got your break in features, but you are now pitching pilots. Is that advice from your management? Y uh, yes. yes. Yeah, it no. kind of is. I yeah, mean, yes and no. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, it's... It's yes in the sense that like ever, there's many more jobs in TV than there is in features right now and for the foreseeable future. No, in the sense that sometimes I get an idea and it's, it's not a feature, it's a show. So therefore it must be written as a show. Yes, it's same thing where it's, uh, the only element I'll, I'll add to that is, uh, it is of my manager's belief that, you know, when you have more credits, sales are more easy, or e easier to attain. You know, people take you more ser to be completely upfront. People take you more seriously, and in in his mind, you know, the easiest way to do that is to is because is in TV because there's so many opportunities, and so that's why staffing is a priority for us this year. Um, mm -hmm. But with that said, um, you know, I it's it's just kind of the same thing with like the, what we talked about with brand earlier. You know, you don't necessarily need to stick with one. You can you can do both, and it's probably in your best interest if you want to, you know, maximize opportunities. Um, so for me, it's like, sometimes I have ideas that are TV. Sometimes they're, they, I do write more features than I do pilots, but um, you know, no one on my team is going to reject a pilot just because, you know, I optioned a feature. They're not going to be like, Oh, you need to stick to features now. So um, I was, you know, all that to say with the credit thing and, you know, you know, not being a green writer, my manager has expressed why it's advantageous to dip into TV as well, but I already wanted to. So. Yeah. So uh, now I'm done. Oh, Any more questions? You, if anyone you, else, you know, watching you has a question, I'm a, I'm a, I am a okay. Sure? Why don't we just <laughs> uh, stay no. right through the Super Bowl. We can <laughs> <all> <laughs> thank, you very, thank you very, very much. Uh, yeah, you, you uh, can DM me, Ramesh. You can, you can <laughs> I know. I will. 
Uh, thank you to everybody who tuned in. It was certainly well worth the two plus hours for them. David yeah. and Lexi, I hope you got something out of it. Uh, at Absolutely. Least maybe, oh my gosh. I now. got to meet Lexi. Yeah. Hey, you're <laughs> Coffee. You want to get coffee? Yeah, you guys are like, you guys are like. I'm in LA too. Coffee. Yeah, let's yeah. Yeah, let's, let's do ahead. it. Yes, I need more writer friends in person too, so we'll do it. Done. Do you know Saeed Sold. Crumpler, by the way? Huh? Do you know Saeed Crumpler? I do. I love Saeed. Saeed's we do. We're gonna get yeah. coffee soon. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Sweet. Maybe right. the three of you should go. There. I think. See, yeah. And bring yeah. Ramesh with you too. Well, you know. Come on out, Ramesh. We're coming out to LA. I'm looking at next month sometime. I would love to be hey. up with you. Let okay, me know. Great. Put me up. Go. Come okay. in. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, David, listen, I Lexi, I love this. Thank you so much for it inviting us on. So generous with your time. I cannot thank you enough. Uh, we are very, very appreciative. And we look forward to hearing more about uh, your careers in the very, very near future. Thank you. Right on. Thank you so much. <laughs>